Our scripture reading for this morning will come from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 26 through 31. That's 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 26 through 31. If you have it, say amen. amen. And the Bible reads, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I have read unto you 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 26 through 31. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers, doers of his word. Would you please stand for prayer? Let us go to our Father in prayer at this time. Most kind and heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Father. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, Father, which you shine on each and every one of us, Father. Father, we ask that you be with us at this time, Father, as we go through your morning worship, Father. Father, we pray that it may be decent and in order to thy sight, Father. Father, we ask that you be with the man of the hour, Brother Troy Marables, Father. Father, we ask that you continue to use him, continue to bless him, Father. Father, we ask that as he delivers that word, Father, Father, we just ask that you will Continue to use him as a vessel, Father. Father, continue to bless him and his family, Father. Father, be with those that are sick and shut in that could not come out this morning to hear a portion of thy worship, Father. Father, we ask that you may bless them as well, Father. Be with those that are grieved this morning, who has lost loved ones, Father. Continue to bless them as well, Father. So, Father, as we go into the remaining part of your service, we just pray that everything may be decent, to thy sight. For this is our prayer in your son, holy and righteous name. Let us all say amen. amen. This morning's lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and it starts at verse 26 and ends at verse 31. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and these things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should be glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And this morning's topic was actually given to me by our minister, Brother Fleming, several months ago. It wasn't designed to be a sermon at that time but instead a Sunday school lesson. He was actually thinking months in advance when they were doing the church calendar, and he wanted this time to be a time when we start to focus on our church family. And just like we had the picnic and we have a friends and family day coming up, and I think Ronnie was probably also given a topic and several others that we're gonna deal with you know, encouraging us as a family of God. And so when he let me know that he was gonna be down for a while and you know, of course, We've got Brother Wise here, and I also wanted to kind of, you know, step in if need be and help wherever he needed it. And uh, I told him I would be willing to step in and actually make this into a sermon and deliver it on Sunday morning. And so he took me up on it. 
<laughs> so uh, here I stand before you. But today's topic is seeing others as God sees them. Seeing others as God sees them. I want to ask now that if you would please to join me in a word of prayer before we get started in this morning's lesson. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day that you have made, and we will certainly rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we do not take for granted your mercies and your grace that you have extended to us and allowed us this opportunity to gather here this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask now, Lord, that as I, your servant, stand before this congregation prepared to deliver a word, that you allow the meditations of my um, mind and my heart be acceptable in thy sight, Lord. That everything that I say be edifying and encouraging and admonishing in whatever way it should be, that it brings out the best in each and every one of us. These and all blessings we ask in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. 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 During the course of this year, we had a trial that just tore this country apart. The Trayvon Martin case. And, depend, you know, it divided us amongst racial lines, political parties. It divided people, whether they were for NRA or not, a, you know, for the NRA. But one of the things that got kind of lost in that whole thing is the loss of a life, a young life. And I think oftentimes we as humans, there's two things that I kind of gleaned from that. This was just personally is that we as humans oftentimes place less value on human life when we feel that it, an individual's life does not live up to our social norms or expectations. What we tend to do is to assess them, assign a number to them, and write an algorithm that kind of defines that person. And that might sound you know, high level for you, but I'll give you just the basics of it. If any of you are on Facebook, basically Facebook is just an algorithm written to identify you. And the reason marketers are now jumping on board Facebook and Facebook is becoming such a driving factor is because A, it has demographics on all the people out there. They know what you like, what you don't like. They know who your friends are. They have facial recognition for the police department. Now you'll see there's a lot more technology coming where they can instantly scan a crowd and tell who's in it because everybody's been tagged, whether you're on Facebook or not. Um, there's a lot of things that are behind the scenes in Facebook. It wasn't just about the social network. They used that to get us all engaged. But the actual Facebook is an algorithm. If you've ever wondered why you have a thousand friends on there, but you only see the black ones, or you only see the white ones, or you only see the ones that you go to church with, or you only see the ones that you tend to interact with most, they know who you're looking for, and they kind of feed the ones that they think you might want to see. And it'll say, you may also know and they, they identify people that you may also know based on where you grew up or, you know, just who they think you are. They also advertise, you know, uh, product advertisements on there based on, you know, what they think you are. If you're in uh, Google Mail or anything like that, you notice there's commercial, there's advertisements that come across there. And you're like, hey, how did they know I like that? You know, or hey, why are they sending me ads about that? They've, they think they've got you figured out. And that's the way we as people want. We want to quickly identify people and put them in a box. That's the way we have to operate. We can't operate in the unknown. We want to quickly say, oh, this is such and such type of person. They're only going to be good for this, or this is this type of person. We need them in the church because they can do such and such. One thing that I want to remind us as a congregation is that, you know, we oftentimes talk about church, church growth and how we want to expand and reach outside into the community. But are you really ready for what you're going to receive when you reach out into the community? When you cast that net, are you ready for what you're going to grasp? And what I hope to do today is to just challenge you. This isn't a sermon that's it's not a happy sermon. It's not a admonishment. I just want to challenge you to think, make you a little uncomfortable so you can kind of think about where we need to be as a congregation as we look forward into the future. And uh, I was listening to the Sunday school lesson this morning and, you know, the topic of homosexuality and such came up. And just think about, you know, those are the souls that we're supposed to be saving. So we've got to get past our own inadequacies and uh, being uncomfortable and be prepared to be living epistles as we've been called to be. You're all familiar with the story of David and how the Bible talks about David. And I think he's one of those characters that we can all relate to 
But we can also see how God can use something that is not what you would typically pick to do an amazing work. The Bible refers to David as a man after God's own heart. We all remember that he defeated Goliath, the Philistine giant. And, you know, we think about that story and it talks about David being ruddy and being a a little boy when all these other men were around there that should have and you would have thought would have been the ones to do his job. But God, God took a little boy named David and used him to slay a giant so that he could do something that hadn't been done in recorded history. He gained the allegiance of 12 tribes and formed the most powerful Middle Eastern kingdom of his era. He brought all the tribes back together again. You remember prior to that, they had been under judges. And so David was the one that brought them under the kingdom, brought them um, back under the king structure. As they had, of course, the children of Israel always looking around, seeing somebody else. That's what they had asked for. So, of course, God gave them a way to bring themselves under the king. But he also proved to be a military genius. And he was also deeply committed to and spiritually sensitive And passionate about God, as is revealed in 73 Psalms that you can read about, uh, 73 poems that you can read about in the book of Psalms. And, you know, today, even in today's time, we still talk about the Psalms that David wrote many, many, many years ago. And we use them as a pattern. Even when we talk about worship and praise to God, we go back and read the book of Psalms and the poetry that was written there. So all of this from someone that you would not believe to be someone that God can use to do great things. Now, we know if you know about David's history and some of the other things he did, and he, yeah, he wasn't always on target. But you know what? God still says he is a man. Uh, he, the Bible says he is a man after God's own heart. And we have to start to look at people and see what makes each of these people special and precious in God's sight. Because God didn't just create some of us to be used for his calling and the rest of us are just here to take up space. Each and every one of us has a little bit of God in us. There is a purpose. My saying that I kind of coined is if you have a pulse, you have a purpose. While you have breath in your lungs, there is something that God has called you to do while you're here on earth. Oftentimes we get caught up in, you know, all the things that happen around us in society, obtaining wealth, obtaining education, obtaining, you know, nicer homes. And all that is great. And God wants you to have those things. But don't let those things have you. Because somewhere in the line, along the line, we forget why we are here on this earth. God's grace prevents any of us from boasting because the Bible teaches us that we are all of him. We all are dependent on God. Regardless of how smart we get, it's funny because as you watch shows, as you watch shows such as um, Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, if any of you have ever checked that out, if you haven't, you, you ought to check it out and see what they're teaching out there uh, because it, you know, it talk, they try to identify and define how things really happen versus what the Bible teaches happen. So they're trying to you know, show is there really a God and how can God and you know, prehistoric times coexist and there are a lot of other things, but it's called Through the Wormhole. And, you know, there are things out there like that now where they're being taught that, you know, this isn't of God. We just happen to be here. And there are probably other forms of life just like us all of throughout the universe. So we have to be bold and stand on our faith. The Bible, uh, going back to that verse that uh, I read for emphasis sake, it says, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And that's to say He wants them to say that doesn't make sense. You know, so when they're doing shows like, you know, uh, through the wormhole, he wants them to be stumped. And they're trying to figure out, you know, how this could have happened. How did the ark really hold all of this? And how did matter really become man? And God does things to just stump. Every time they think they've got him figured out, he switches it up on them. And God has chosen weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty, which is to say there is no possible way that could have happened. You know, oftentimes we look at, you know, the Bible stories where it talks about God just taking a few that lap like a dog and going out and destroying armies. And we see things in our world where you're like, how in the world could that have possibly happened? But that's just God showing you how awesome and truly awesome he is. And then it says, and base things of this world and things which are despised has God chosen ye. And that's to say he chose who to do what? So it's like when you see me standing up here, you're like, he chose him to do what? That's the way God operates. He wants us to 
be so mystified by his ways to know that his thoughts are higher than his, than ours. And one thing that I, you know, I won't say that I had three points or anything like that, but I will say this is one that you might want to write down, is that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Yeah, you've heard it many times, but I want you to, if, if nothing else, I'm going to give you three of these things that I want you to take back and just think about throughout the week. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And I want you to brace yourself because here's where the paradigm shift begins. God does not need you to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in this world. I, I don't know what your mother told you growing up or how special, you know, auntie so-and-so told you you were. God does not need you to accomplish what he needs to get accomplished in this world. Oftentimes we think that the church only operates because we are here or because we're given our money or because, um, you know, our family was the ones that helped start it. But you wait and pass on and see if the church doesn't go on. They'll, they'll eat that chicken and the church will carry on. You know, and the Bible talks about, you know, when you, when you go down and read uh, Revelations 22 and 17, the Bible states, whosoever will, let him come. And I want to talk a little bit about that this morning because that's what it's all getting to when we talk about seeing others as God sees them. We want that whosoever will to come into our midst and be part of this family here at Newburgh. Giving you some Bible examples, uh, just talking about Joseph. I heard little Peyton this morning talking about him uh, when he got up to tell about the story of Joseph. And in the Bible, you know, Joseph becomes Pharaoh's right hand man. Joseph can interpret dreams and he saves Egypt from a famine. But before that, Joseph was two things that weren't all that great. Joseph started his life in Egypt as a slave. And then he was thrown into prison. So you think about us, even as a society, there are those out there that are slave to whatever it may be. And some even in slavery, physical slavery. When we talk about countries, you know, we live in, you know, yes, America has all its flaws. But if you stop and look around at some of these other countries where people are sold into uh, sex slave trading and other things, you think about it's not that bad here after all. We've got a lot of work to do and we've fallen a long way from where we should have been. But, you know, let's not be too hard on ourselves. We still need to stand up and be the children that God has called us to be. You think about Moses. If you were a shepherd and your local daily and your daily work consisted of leading a bunch of sheep around, you'd probably be shocked if God called you directly and revealed himself to you and told you that you were going to lead his people. But, you know, you think about it. God took someone that probably said, I have trouble speaking. I'm not the person that you want in front of, you know, a crowd. But, you know, I can really relate to Moses when I think about, you know, some of those things. I grew up, and I'll tell you this, and I'll probably reference it later, but I grew up and I actually had to take speech classes early on in life. You know, I had trouble uh, using good diction. And actually, you know, my mother used to tease me and said, don't talk with a thick tongue. And uh, I was in um, school and I would take speech classes and I did the little she sells seashells down by the seashore. You probably remember all the little tongue twisted, which that's hard even if you can't speak. But um, they'd have you doing all those kind of things. But, you know, that's one of the things that I was determined to overcome is to be able to use good diction when I'm in mixed company, when I'm at work or whenever, you know, someone sees me. I didn't want that to be the first thing that they judged about me. But you've got to realize that there are going to be people coming in here that may not talk like you talk. They may not use the diction that we use. But if I can overcome some of those same things, give them a chance. Give them a chance. Don't be too hard on them. You think about it. None of us come out of the womb full grown. You know, we think about where we are now and we want to put that on new individuals walking through these doors. But we got to realize that none of us came out matured like we are now. God has worked some things out of us. And we'll talk about that later on. But uh, you think about Gideon. God used Gideon to deliver, deliver Israel from Midians. Uh, but before that, Gideon was nothing more than a farmer. Esther, like Joseph, she was a slave before God used her to save people from being massacred. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a peasant girl. And think about this. Although the conception was immaculate, Jesus was born into an interesting family dynamic, wouldn't you say? <laughs> you know, think how quickly would have judged Mary, you know, if it had been in today's time and she was carrying the son of God. Luke, 
Luke traveled with Paul, giving him uh, a companion to the journey. With Luke would, uh, would also write one of the four Gospels. But Luke was nothing more than a physician. Peter, many of the disciples were just common fishermen and would go on to do God's work. But Peter is the best example as he would be an apostle, a leader of the early church, and he would write two letters in the Bible. So think about this modern application. Someone that has lost everything he or she has and is now homeless, but now believes that Jesus can supply all their needs. A man that was once a drunkard and or a drug addict that abused his body because he felt he had nothing to live for, but now feels that Jesus can give him hope. The woman that has been abused and molested all of her life, she has low to no self-esteem, but now realizes that Jesus may be the lover she's been looking for in all the wrong places. The man that once beat his wife and the wife that once suffered domestic violence, who now look to Jesus and the church for the perfect example of a bride and groom. All of these people that I just described to you live in our society and all of them need Jesus. And who are we with our preconceived notions, our hidden agendas, our personal inadequacies to stand between them and their soul's salvation? And oftentimes that's exactly what we do. And church, I want to encourage you to think about that. Go back and do some evaluation of yourself and think about where these people are and what they need and how you can be a living epistle. Oftentimes, we just want to regurgitate scripture and quote it to them, but we're not a living, breathing Bible that they can see and understand. That's what we need to be. We need to take in the word of God to the point that it just emits from all of our, our being, that they come in contact with God through us. Because that's exactly what happens. Either we do or we don't. When we go to work and we don't act the way we should, we're giving them what we want. Whether we want them to catch it or not, we're letting them know how we really feel about God. You can sing all the songs you want to, but they're going to look at how you handle the situations that come at you. And I, I want to say this, and I give some examples of, you know, the Bible talks, such were some of you. You know, we think about, you know, each of all of us. Yeah, now we're cleaned up and we're sitting here in our, you know, in our clothes and we look good. But, you know, some of y'all used to pop, lock and drop it yourselves back when you could. You know, now you pop something out of place, you lock up something or you keep dropping everything because your strength has failed. And some of you guys were smooth operators back before you went bald or turned gray. You know, and then I think about some of the ladies, you know, yeah, you were down with brick house back in the day, but now it's like pick up the pieces. You know, so you got to you got to remember. Yeah, it's easy for us to say, oh, I only I dress modestly and I carry myself in this manner and I'm this and I'm that. Yeah, some of it, if God had still allowed you to have that strength, you would have still been stuck in some of them. You still been in the club, that old man, old woman in the club. So just think about that next time you quickly cast judgment on somebody that walks in here. And if it weren't for, you know, some of the older sisters or older men kind of teaching and encouraging you and molding you gently, you wouldn't be where you are today. I, I said I was going to mention this a little more to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I grew up in the West End, of course, and, uh, I, you know, I, I hung out with some cats from Victory Park and some of them were Crips and some other things. But we had, I, you know, I had some friends that did all kind of things. Uh, my father died when I was 13. Uh, I had an older father. He was born in 1918. My parents were old, much older. But they were very wise, so they gave me a lifetime's worth of knowledge in the very short years that I had with them. But, you know, you would look at that and people with society would quickly categorize that and say, ah, uh, young black male from West End, friends, gang associated, uh, he has trouble speaking. Nah, he's not going to amount to much. But I think overall I've grown up to be a pretty respectful, mannerable man and productive member of society. And it's not because of anything that I have done. It's just God working in me. God had a greater calling for my life. And something else that uh, you may not know about me is that I actually failed eighth grade. I failed eighth grade. I started out, I was in traditional school. I was at JCTMS. Mr. Uh, Brother Clemens is one of my counselors. He waved his hands. <laughs> Brother Clemens was one of my counselors 
back today. And uh, matter of fact, the uh, the teacher that failed me is a good friend of mine now, but uh, her husband's a famous artist uh, here in town. I won't say his name or call their name, but uh, he's a very he's a sculptor. So I'll give you that little hint. But uh, his wife was my teacher, and she failed me because she said, "I know you can do better than this." And so. Through that charge, I went from being in class with uh, Mike Robinson and Sherry Dickerson, which you know them and members here. I was in their class, and I ended up graduating with Monica Shekels. So the God was good. I was able to stay in traditional school. And uh, the funny thing is, I went from failing eighth grade to being a straight A student from then on, and ended up graduating and getting a full ride scholarship to my choice of several colleges, which I ended up going to Florida A&M University free. You know, and I shared with you earlier how I said that I had speech therapy early on, you know, and so of course, you know, my mother being the woman that she was, she didn't want people to label me as soon as they saw me, so she constantly worked with me. She put in time to make sure that anytime I present myself to people, she wanted them to see my best foot forward. So there was none of that sagging pants and, you know, coming out with your hair undone or coming out with, you know, I, I don't even, I tell my girls when I, you know, when I talk to them about me and I don't have to tell them what not to bring home. I was just like, when is the last time you seen your father come out sweaty and dirty and smelly? Even if I've been doing the yard, when's the last time you saw me go to the grocery like that? When's the last time you seen me without my hair cut, my beard shaved or trimmed up or whatever? And I said, that's all I need to say, you know, and so they know what, you know, what to bring home or what not to bring home. <laughs> and they'll tell you, the, the story is, if you show up at the door and I look and like, you know, take him right on back where you got him from. <laughs> and it's hard because, you know, uh, my daughter shared with me that, you know, when you set the bar high, a lot of guys don't want to step up to that. But I've always told them, don't, don't, don't be so narrow minded just to look at what's here in Newburgh or what's here in this community. You know, I don't care if they marry someone that's from a different culture. Of course, there's things that you're going to have to overcome. But I want them to think broadly because whatever God has for them, he has for them. And I want them to be open and ready to receive it. And don't lower your standards just to get what you want when God has something greater for you. And I said that because I want to say this other this is another one of the points that I want you to take home with you so that you can remember throughout the week. God is, uh, is more interested in your availability than your ability. God is more interested in your availability than your ability. You'd be surprised what God can use when you make it available. A lot of times we look for the most educated, the wealthiest, the most uh, eloquent speakers, etc., and many times if we just make ourselves available, God can add those things unto you. But he's looking for people that will be available. When these church doors open and you look and, you know, like you said, Sunday school, many of us feel like we already know enough. We don't have to be here. We don't have to learn from one another. You should have a desire to try to become better. Even if you think you know something, come and listen to some opposing point of views or hear some other things. You might find out you don't know everything you thought you did. And I found in life that truly wise people are the ones that actually say, I don't know a lot. They want to know more. The people that feel like they already know enough or they don't need that are usually the ones that have limited their amount of knowledge that they're going to gain. So open yourself up to learn more about the word of God and how it can be applied to your life. There might be something, the very thing you need might be here on Sunday morning and you haven't been here to hear it all this time. I want to define how we see one another. Lord, I got to pick up the pace. I told myself I wasn't going <laughs> to be this slow. Um, but define how we see one another. Our ways are not God's ways, according to Isaiah 55 and 8. When man looks at you, man looks out here at this audience and he says he sees us dressed in our Sunday best. What God is looking for is people prepared to worship and give God their best. When man looks at us, he's looking for unblemished, perfect individuals. But God is looking for broken but ready for a healing, Amen. people that can be used for his calling. We look for individuals that are educated, and God is looking for people willing to learn his ways. Amen. We look for wealthy. We start looking at things like where they live, how much they make, and God's looking for people ready to receive a blessing. You know, we sing that song, why did my Savior come to earth and choose this lowly birth because he loved me so? Would you think about that example that Christ has set 
is that he wanted to show that even of the lowest of low, you know, when they talk about nothing good could come from Nazareth, and then here's a king, the savior of all that came out of Nazareth. Just to define how God sees us, God sees us as being created in his image. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, according to Psalms 139, 13 through 16. We are also his people, according to Psalms 100. And we are created with a mind, will, emotions, and spirit. And that's what separates us from the rocks that we read about that would cry out if we don't say anything. God wants his creation to be the one to praise him and give him all the glory. Man that was created in his image. Here's another point that I want you to take back home with you, and it's actually from a famous American entrepreneur by the name of Jim Ron, and it states, show your contempt for the problem and your concern for the person. Show contempt for the problem and your concern for the person. And even though he's given credit for saying that quote, when you read John 3.16, it still shows that God had this in mind all along the way. He gave his son his only begotten son, that we may have eternal life. And when you think about all that's going on in society today, oftentimes we get on the bandwagon of wanting to beat down those that already, they already know they've got some issues going on. And even when we talk about homosexuality and such, we've got to be a people that are ready to show contempt for the problem, but concern for the people. You can't go into this showing contempt for the people. And oftentimes that's what we do. We go in offending and, you know, in our, in our efforts, we think we're defending the gospel and actually we're tearing down people, turning them off and running them away from the church. We've got to learn how to show contempt for what is sin and then be willing to be concerned for what is God's, the people. And, some, um, and then also we can be redeemed by Christ. And that's another thing that's you know, to note about humans is that we can be redeemed by the blood of Christ. So before you quickly categorize somebody and condemn them and cast, you know, put judgment on them, realize that they can be redeemed from that situation just like you were. Just like God took me up out of the clubs and doing all kind of dirt. And I mean, I can just go a few years and say that there are things that he has brought me up out of. He can do that for you, too. And one thing that my mother used to always tell me, and I found it to be, and you've heard this saying many times, but um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's great that you are a walking Bible. It's great that you can answer all the questions in Sunday school. But you know, until you can learn how to apply that and convey it to people in such a way that they can apply it to their lives, it's not going to be effective. We need to become more effective at being living epistles, as the Bible teaches us, so that we can convey the word of God to those that we come in contact in a way that will entice them to find out more about the hope that we have, that anchor that is Jesus Christ. There's a quote from a movie, uh, one of my favorite movies, Avatar, from 2009, and many of you probably have seen it. Some of you may not have. Um, but this was the first film in history to gross over $2 billion, so it is very, very um, widely known. But in this movie, there was a character by um, Zoe Saldana, who plays a character, uh, Natiri. And she has three words that she says in that movie that are just poignant to what we're talking about today. She simply says, I see you. I see you. And what she's saying in this um, piece is not that she sees the person in front of her. If, you, if you're not familiar with the movie, I'll tell you a little bit about the Avatar. Um, the character actually, he, um, it's a person that actually puts his being into this animated object, these blue, tall creatures that live on a futuristic planet after the Earth is destroyed. And he's uh, it's like taking myself and putting it in another being. And he was in there interacting with these other beings. And she's telling, her, telling him that she can see not only his exterior, but she sees through to the interior. She already knew what he was, even though he was, you know, carrying out the daily work and acting like one of them. She's saying, I see you. And that's the way we need to be as Christians. We need to do like God does and look beyond the exterior and look through the person, looking into what God sees and see what is it about this person that God sees that makes them so special. You know, we talk about Saul converting to Paul and, you know, he persecuted the Christians and then became one of the greatest defenders of the faith. 
but do we apply that in today's time and look for that homeless person that, yeah, he doesn't smell so good right now, but a little soap and water will take care of that. A shave will take care of that. He might have something he's passionate about, or he or she may have something that they're passionate about, and God's been waiting to use them for a long time. So we have to open ourselves up to be ready to receive all kinds when we say that we're ready to grow this congregation. The Church of Christ has um, survived throughout the ages because the gospel of Christ supersedes our cultural and ethnic differences. I think, in fact, if some were to compare how and where the body of Christ worships in the first century and the songs that they sang with how and where we worship and the songs that we sing, you'd probably be in for a startle. You see a lot of startling differences when you talk about the churches at Ephesus and those cultures and those people and where they worshiped and what they sang versus how we operate as a church today. But the primary reason the church has survived is because it has continued to embrace that, remaining true to the doctrine, but opening ourselves up to realize that this world is continuously changing and we're continuing to evolve with it. We have to hang on to the doctrine at all cost. But just remember that in our short reference, um, one thing that we have to remember is that we have a short reference of memory. We look at the church from like the 60s to now, and that's all we think about. We don't think about it started way back then. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have microphones. They didn't have, you know, and, and I often ask myself, even when we talk about song leaders and such, you think about it, how did they lead songs when you have thousands of people standing out there? How did they carry their, you had to have some other people involved to kind of get this, you see how I'm talking? You see what I'm talking about? You think about it, but we have a reference. We only think about my time, my lifetime, and what we have. So just kind of keep your mind open to realize that, you know, things could change in how we, as this congregation, Newberg, are. I wanted to, um, you know, just kind of talk about last Sunday. I, I thought that was a really, I, I really appreciate the elders for being bold men and doing what they did last Sunday because it challenged this congregation. And I was, I was pleasantly, yes, you deserve it. I was um, really pleased to see the outcome of that because not only did you rise to the challenge, but we had a day all day long together. You know, we kept last Sunday as holy as we do any other Sunday. We came, we worshiped, and the evening service, we had that as well. Had, matter of fact, we even had some good caramel cake for those of you that came back for even homemade caramel cake. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, the person who made that caramel cake knew what they were doing. I, you know, I don't know, many of you may not know that uh, my mother used to teach us what, it, what one got a lesson, everybody got a lesson. So I can sew, crochet, knit, I can do knit one, pearl two, I can cook. And uh, cooking is one of the things I really enjoy doing. So I remember she used to have us in the kitchen and teaching us how to make that caramel icing. And she was like, wait till you get that soft ball in that hot water. And so I knew when the icings were right. So I, this person knew how to make that icing. But... Uh, <laughs> So it was, if nothing else, it was worth coming back just to get that, uh, that caramel cake. But we had a wonderful sermon that evening, and everything was just wonderful. Um, you know, things that we normally would have done when we left one another, we actually did together as a family. You know, you would have went home and ate. Some of you would have went outside and hung out. Some of you would have listened to music. Well, this last Sunday, we spent the whole day just enjoying a good cookout out at the park, and we hung together and, you know, encouraged one another, got to know some of some individuals that we probably didn't know and uh, outside of the church realm. So it was really good to do that, and I, I pray that we continue that uh, in future years. And I, I just, once again, just want to thank the elders for that opportunity. I'm going to get ready to wrap this up. I, like I said, I wanted to make sure I didn't stay up here too long because I can run my mouth when actually I get started. <laughs> but in conclusion... Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14 says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled out the written code with all its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. What you need to grasp from this and the main thing that you need to know because as we're getting ready to go into what it takes to become a member of the body, the main thing that you need to know is that a debt was paid on your behalf that you could not pay yourself so that you could have eternal life. If you grasp that, accept that, believe that, and are willing to make a change in your life, 
you are ready to be baptized. I know a lot of times we often want to, like I said, once again, we want people to come down full grown. But basically, you just need to know that a debt was paid on your behalf that you could not pay for sins that you have committed. So and so that you can have eternal life. So if you're willing and ready for that, you're ready for the plan of salvation, which we read in our Bible. That first you must hear the gospel, which comes from Romans 10, 17, where it says faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And John 8 and 32 says that you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. We also read that you must believe the word of God, the gospel of Christ. And that's Hebrews 11 and 6, where it says without faith, it is impossible to please him. In John 20 and verse 31, it says you must believe in Christ and through his name um, and you will have life through his name. You also must be ready to repent, which is to change, to have a total change of mind towards what you've been doing. The things that you know have separated you from God, you need to be prepared to turn away from. And we read that in Luke 13 and 3. And it says, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Also in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, God commands us all to repent. He once winked at sin, but now we are all commanded to repent. And we also must confess faith in Jesus Christ. And, you know, it used to be a time when you say that that's not hard to do. But the more and more this world progresses on, Christians are becoming more and more persecuted, even in the United States. So what you must be prepared to do is to stand boldly and proclaim his name. And Romans 10 and 10 says, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Matthew 10 and 32 also says that confess me and I will com confess you before my father, which is in heaven. And it was good to hear one of the young ladies quote that in, uh, in the Sunday school promotion Sunday this morning. Uh, it, that's what it's all about is confessing the greatest name, the sweetest name ever known to man. Then you must be prepared to go down into the watery grave of baptism. Galatians 3 and 27 says, as many have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Mark 16 and 16 says that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And Acts 2 and 38 says that repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of your sins. Having said that, I'm going to ask now that those of you that are able to stand, I'm going to ask Brother Corey if he'll come lead us in a selection. And if God has touched you this morning and you feel that now is the time, come forward as we together stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs> 